happy Wednesday. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, our birds today uh, are eared greaves. These are our water birds that uh, we've caught here in, in fine plumage with their, their crests and their uh, kind of ear feathers and their bright red eyes. And something that, that all water birds need to do is uh, dry off their feathers. So you'll see from time to time go do a sort of kind of puffing up, uh, airing out sort of dance as they, as they dry off. Uh, a somewhat uh, stranger creature is this baby coot, perhaps colored this way to uh, appear scarier or dangerous to predators. And uh, uh, this, this baby is, is hungry and, and uh, doesn't, uh, 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 no, no adult coots are around, so it uh, heads over to the, the, the greaves to see if it can, it can get some food uh, from, from them. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it uh, to, to you to decide whether this kind of is the, the start of a, a beautiful friendship or, or whether the, the baby coot joins the cycle of life. All right. <laughs> What uh, what questions do you have about uh, functions, conditionals, the lab, anything we've been talking about? All right. So to start off today, I want to return to that guessing game that we were talking about on Monday. Remember that we got a random secret number, got the user's guess, converted that guess to an integer, and then used if, elif, and else to figure out kind of what are we going to print in response to that guess. But there's one thing about this guessing game that's really uh, a bit sad is that the, the player gets one guess. I mean, we print out a hit, but, hint, but they, they don't ever get another guess. And so uh, we'd really like to modify this to be able to give, uh, give the player multiple guesses. So I'd like you to uh, take a couple minutes and brainstorm with your neighbors uh, what you would do, how you would change this, this guessing game program to say, uh, give the player five guesses, five attempts to to guess the right number. Okay. Yeah, anyway. You could um, put another function um, mm -hmm. if the if their guess is equal to secret, then print winner mm -hmm. else enter another guess. <laughs> So we could use uh, uh, an if to decide whether we, we give them a, another guess. Um, maybe uh, to put a kind of slight twist on that, if guess does not equal secret. So if they didn't get it right, uh, then I'll just want to do getting, getting the guess and printing a hint again. So, kind of using using an if else for that. Paul, did you have a, a thought? Uh, well, I was thinking like, can you call? I guess you can't call the function you're defining within itself. Does that have, like it'd be nice to say within like all the other conditions where you're not actually getting the right answer before you hit the return? You like do the function. Uh, never mind. Uh, yeah, I, I can see where you're going, but that that would get pretty tricky to try and um, kind of nest these things kind of within each other. Uh, other, other thoughts, I've, I've given the player one additional guess with the code that I've written here. Uh, how might I give them um, more than one additional guess? Yeah, my. Yes, yeah, so there's uh, some, some code from the, the current lab that uh, uh, it's a function called, called play, new, play loop, not one of the ones that you have to 
implement, but yes, uh, uh, having uh, something that is going to repeat the same steps over and over again in, say, a loop is uh, something that could be a, a nice thing here. Yes? I was just going to say for loop. Yes, so uh, we're, we're kind of jumping to, uh, to, to, where, to where we're headed, uh, which is something called a, a for loop. But there is, I just wanted to point out, uh, a way that we could do this just with what we already know, which is just using the magic of copy paste. Every additional guess we want to give, we would take this same, if they haven't guessed it yet, get another guess and just copy paste that out. Um, and we could even tell them you have four guesses left for here. You have three guesses left for here, and we could do that. Two guesses left, one guess is left. And just by doing this sort of, I'm going to take the thing that I want to happen again in my program and just put those same, those same instructions to the computer once, once more. So what are this, this copy-paste approach? I can use it to give my, my player five guesses. What are some potential uh, problems or reasons why I wouldn't why maybe we shouldn't be satisfied with this. Yeah. If he gets it on the first try, if they get it on the first or second try, it's just going to keep on giving them the same problem over and over again. So there's, we, we have to be careful that we don't keep going and keep asking for guesses once they get it right. Uh, if I put all of these inside a check, if they haven't guessed it yet, then it won't do any of the ones after that. But yeah, that's something that we have to, we have to think about. Yeah, Sammy. Uh, the code is just only, if you keep repeating it over and over, it's just going to give you a lot of code. So to condense it, it would be easier. Yeah, if we want to be really generous and give the player 100 guesses, well, now we're copy pasting out this same if, if uh, statement 100 different times. Uh, I know that I wouldn't wouldn't uh, have fun have fun doing that. So yeah, it's, it doesn't let us do repeat something a lot of times. Other potential issues with with my copy paste strategy. Yes, uh, Eric. I mean, if you made a mistake one time and then copied it a bunch of times, you have to modify it like in five different places. Yes, yes. This is one of the banes of, of copy and paste. Any error, any problem in the first thing gets copied out however many times. And once you find it, uh, you have to go and fix them all. Uh, if I have this print statement that says four guesses left, maybe I copy that out and I have to remember to go and change the number each time. Yeah, so fortunately, Python gives us a specific thing that does exactly what we want to do in this situation. A way to take some set of steps, some uh, things we want the computer to do, and just say, repeat this. So what does this actually look like in Python? As the name suggests, we're going to start with the word for, and then we're going to have a variable name that I have named loop variable, but could be named anything. It's just a, just a variable name like other ones we've seen. And then we have the word in and then some sequence. And uh, at the end, we have a colon. I think I'm going to write it on this board so that it's easier to see. Colon. And like other things that we've seen with a colon, other sort of uh, instructions in Python that have steps inside of them. We're going to use an indent to tell what steps are going to be repeated 
inside this loop. So we have some indent, and maybe we have, maybe one of our steps is to print out our loop variable. Now, based on other things that we have seen in Python, anyone have an idea of how we know where the loop ends, how we know where we don't have steps that are going to get repeated? Yeah, Jeffrey. And the line of code is matching the indent of the print. Yeah. Uh, it's, in matching the for loop. Yeah, when we, once we have some code that isn't indented, that's going to tell us where the end of our our loop is. So this printing of loop over is not part of the code inside the loop. So what this will do is this loop variable is going to be assigned to the first thing in this sequence. So calling this a sequence because it's some number of things in a particular order. And we'll talk more about examples of what a sequence is in a moment. But sequence has some things in it. And the loop variable, when we get to this for loop, we're going to assign it to the first thing in the sequence. Can anyone remind us what assigning means? How we've how we've thought about that in the past? Is that like yeah. just like the variable and then like one equals sign and then the thing? Yeah. Assignment was our like x equals five. When we took five, we put it and a spot in memory, and we gave it the label x. So here, we're going to have the first thing in the sequence. It's going to go into a spot in memory, and we're going to label it with our variable name, loop variable. Then we go into the steps inside our loop, and At the end of our loop, there are two things that could happen. If there are things that are left in our sequence, I said, right, that loop variable is assigned to the first thing. So if there are more things that we haven't assigned loop variable to in our sequence, We're going to go back to the start of the loop, back to the, the first step inside our loop, and assign our loop variable to the next thing in our sequence. Otherwise, if there aren't things left in our sequence, we're just going to leave the loop, continue on with whatever code comes after it. So let's do uh, an actual example. Oh, geometry. Goodbye. So if I were to write uh, a version of this loop where I replace sequence with an actual thing, I might write for number n. And then one way to make a sequence of things in Python is to take a square bracket 
and then put my sequence of things inside square brackets separated by commas. So maybe I'd say two, four, six. And then I'll just do what I had over there, print number, and then print loop over. And when I run this code, number, I assign it to the first thing in the sequence. So number is going to be two. Then I go to my steps in the loop. That is going to print out a two. I'm at the end of the loop. There are more things in my sequence. So I go back to the top. Number now, I assign it to the next thing in the sequence. So number is now four. I'm going to print out four when I do my steps in the loop. And now at the end, still things left in my sequence. Return to the top, assign number to the next thing in my sequence, print out six. And now there are no more things in the sequence, so I would print out loop over. All right, ask me some questions about this. Cool. Ah, yes, if we want to leave a loop early, we can use break. to leave a loop. So if we ever get to a line of code that just says break, that tells the computer this loop is over, go to whatever is after the loop. So that's one way to, to, to exit a, a loop in the middle of it if, um, yes? So to use that, for example, could you put in like it else clauses in a, a loop and then put break within one of those so that it doesn't necessarily reach that unless the condition is met? Yes, absolutely. And that's typically the way it would be it would be used. That there would be under some condition you'd want to end the loop early and so break would show up inside some sort of if else. What other questions do you have? Cool. Does sequence always have to be um, this like, comma separate from this like, thing? Or if you have a variable or sequence? Okay. Yes, yeah, so there's in fact, many different kinds of sequences in Python. This kind of sequence with square brackets is called a list. And in Python, it's one of our ways of collecting uh, several different values together. And yes, we can absolutely assign it to, to a variable. So you could say my list equals this sequence of two, four, and six. And then you could use my list as the, as the sequence part of, part of the loop. Does that make, yeah, Finley. What can lists contain? Lists can contain anything. <laughs> Even other lists, as we'll we'll see later on. But yes, things inside a list, any any kind of value we can have in Python can can live happily inside a list. Other questions? All right. So let's do a little bit of practice. So for this, we will need our cards. They're in their usual stacks over there. Please try to get uh, your, your number. If you have a, a, someone else's number, it will cause a little chaos for, for something we're doing later. <coughs> All right, so a couple of things about this question. First thing to know about loops, unlike functions, Loops are not their own little world. Things that happen inside loops 
don't stay inside loops. So that's one thing to keep in mind for this, uh, uh, for this question. Uh, the other is that for the answers given, imagine each of those numbers are on their own line, which is how uh, uh, every time we, we use print, we get something on its, on its own line. So take, uh, take a couple minutes and uh, think through what, what you expect this might print. All right, we're uh, various minds, so please discuss with your neighbors what you think this. All right, big movement toward D. That is indeed what this code is going to do. And this is because our loop variable Y, it's a variable like any other variable that we have been working with. And when it gets assigned to a thing in our sequence, it's like we just had y equals 9, for example, as its own, its own line. We'll have all the same effects that, that that line would have. And so y gets assigned to 13 last, and we will then, it will be 13 once we, once we leave the loop. What are your questions on this example? Yes. Um, I'm a little confused how like y equals two affects the loop if it does at all. So that's a good question. Does y equals two affect our loop? So one way to think about this is we can replace our loop with a sort of equivalent code in Python that doesn't doesn't use a loop, which would be y equals two. And then the first thing the loop does is assign our loop variable to the first thing in our sequence, which would be y equals 9. And then we print y. And then we have y equals 3. Print y. And so on. And so looking at, at this code, we would say this y equals 2, does it, does it affect anything? No, because it's immediately replaced with y equals 9. Cool? So if you wanted to be the first uh, print, you said like for y and y, sine 3, 6, 1, 3, 2? Uh, yes, we could say for y in y, 9, 3, 6, 1, 13. And then y would be assigned to its current value as the, f the first time through the loop. So that would put that would first print out two before for the rest of the stuff. What other questions do you have? Yeah, David. So, like, unlike the functions, um, for loops are not like in their own little world. That's right. Yeah. The, whatever happens in for loops is just like we had code outside the for loop. Other questions? All right, let's bring some ideas together and look at a similar loop, but this time we have an if else inside the loop. So uh, again, uh, take a bit to, to even work through what what this will print out at the end. All right, maybe one, maybe one of the others. Please discuss with your neighbors uh, how this will be this will be executed. We're converging on C, which in this case is what uh, results going to be at the uh, at the end of this uh, loop. Uh, volunteers to for things that were helpful as you were thinking uh, through what this was going to do. Things that you kept track of or that, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I kept track of the x and y, but also kept track of the result every time and basically put that in just like one singular like, like operation line, I guess, so that I could just do the adding and subtracting in one thing rather than 
having to do it each time I read it. Yeah, the, the keeping track on paper of what is happening is uh, a program gets executed can be a really helpful way to figure out what it's going to do or to try and figure out where it's going wrong. That just because we're, we're putting the code on a computer doesn't mean that we, uh, it's not useful to, to bring some kind of pen and paper uh, into that. Uh, other observations, things that uh, were helpful? Yeah. I mean, honestly, one of the first things that I almost missed was the x equals y at the end of it. So I'm just making sure that you do that every single time. Yeah, that's, that's something uh, that's important when we're working with Python, particularly now that we have several different kinds of things that involve indenting, is uh, and this is a, a screenshot from VS Code, which is putting these, these lines here to show kind of where the indentation is. But knowing that this x equals y is inside our loop, but is outside this if and else, so it's always going to happen uh, every time uh, through the loop, no matter what. Other thoughts? One bit of terminology that I should mention is that uh, each time we go through a loop, uh, and in this case, how many times did we, we go through our loop? Yeah. Five, as there, our sequence had five things in it, once for every everything in there. Each time we go through a loop, is called an iteration. And computer scientists will say uh, this loop is iterating over our sequence nine, three, six, one, thirteen. Uh, each time through the loop is one iteration. Uh, uh, of our of our loop. All right, so we wanted this this loop, uh, this for loop thing, because we wanted to uh, uh, make our guessing game uh, without having to copy paste a whole bunch of times. So now uh, I can kind of take all the code for getting a guess and printing a hint and put it all inside of a loop so that I just get a guess and print a hint some number of times. And so I might say for guesses left in the list five, four, three, two, one. This is the, the sequence. They have five guesses left, four guesses left, three guesses left, and so on. indent this all inside the loop and if I wanted to print out how many guesses left they had uh, is there what uh, does anyone have a suggestion for for how uh, how I would would uh, what I would add to this line to actually print out the number of guesses they have left Yes, we can just use this guesses left variable, which is going to be assigned to these numbers in our sequence, uh, like we would uh, any of our, our other variables. So we'll, we'll get shown how many guesses uh, we have left. And uh, we probably also uh, don't want to have the player keep guessing once they, they've gotten it correct. So we talked earlier about this thing called break, which is how we leave a loop early. So 
we can use that here to say, all right, if they have guessed the secret and the loop. Every time we get their guess, print out a hint, and then if they have guessed it right, we'll just leave the loop and uh, not have it keep asking them for guesses. And then I can get rid of all my, my copy-pasted code. Questions on on using our our loop in this in this guessing game? Cool. If I wanted to give them say a hundred guesses, and I didn't want to type out hundred comma not ninety nine comma, um, how would you go about that? Yeah. So good question. Uh, so far, the only way I've shown you to create a sequence is by putting these square brackets and writing out all the things inside the sequence. So it might be really nice if Python had a function that could just give us a sequence of you know, any amount of numbers that we wanted. Good news is that Python does have such a function. That if we want a sequence of numbers from some starting number up to some stopping number, we can use the built-in range function to do this, where range of 0, 100 will give us the sequence 0, 1, 2, up to 99. Because we go we go up to but not including this stop number. So when we ask Python from a range 0 to 100, it includes 0, but not 100. And this range function returns a sequence. So we could use it uh, anywhere that we could use uh, a sequence of another kind. So I could say range uh, from 0 to 5 or 0 to 100 to have uh, this loop go around that many times. Uh, and so that's, this is one nice way of being able to like get a sequence of kind of any size that, that, that we need. Other questions? All right, so one of the things that uh, I said on the very first uh, class that we had together was my goal was to uh, show you all the different sorts or many of the different sorts of things that we, we can use computers to do. Uh, so far, we've used computers to do math. We've used them to do this little guessing game, used them to... Uh, print text in different colors when we were looking at the uh, at, at uh, displaying the weather. And so I also want to show you, we can use computers for art. And uh, things like loops are very useful for making kind of interesting, interesting sorts of art. It's also the case that the lab uh, that's, that's at today, Lab 2, uh, is uh, graphical. You'll actually be implementing uh, uh, the classic arcade game Breakout. We're bouncing a ball uh, and breaking bricks. So also want to talk about how the, the basics of, of this sort of graphic stuff that we're going to be using. So we're using something called PGL. It's short for Portable Graphics Library this is something created by computer scientist Eric Roberts at Stanford. And 
uh, like other uh, modules that we've seen, we can import stuff from it. So I've imported uh, something called G window and something called G oval that I, I'm going to use. And I've defined a couple variables, G window width and G window height. Uh, this is not something that Python actually enforces, but uh, by convention, all caps means that these values don't change. So I've defined this width and height, and I've made the variable names all caps to indicate these are kind of the, the one true value this variable should have, should have. You should just use it as this kind of constant um, that doesn't change. And the first thing I need to do to get graphics going is, cre is to create a window uh, that has a particular width and height. And if I run this, I have my, my beautiful canvas. Now, I haven't put anything in it yet, but I have created this window uh, that's kind of 500 wide and 800 tall. So let's put something in my in my world. Uh, what what Marco? Uh, so the file that I have here is posted on the course calendar as art.py. So you can you can look there if you uh, if you'd like to to follow along. Um, if I want to to put something in my graphical world, maybe I want to put a circle. And uh, this G oval, any sort of thing that I want to put in my world, I need to tell it where, I need to tell Python where it goes and how big it is. Where it goes comes first, and how big it is in a width and height comes second. So now if I run the program, well, that's annoying it's still this blank canvas and this is because even though i have created my circle here i have not added it to the window i have not told my my window here that it should it should draw the circle so the kind of missing piece here is adding the circle to my window Now I see my lovely empty circle uh, sitting up in the upper left. And this is an important thing to keep in mind when we're working with this portable graphics library. That in our canvas, Z the position zero zero is in the upper left. So that's why this circle, which I said put it at zero zero, showed up in the upper left. And then the lower left would be 0, 0800, because I told the window to be 800 in height. Lower right would be 500, 800, because I told it to be 500 wide. And upper left, 500, 0. What are your questions on, on the getting this graphics thing showing up with the circle? All right, so my blank uh, uh, canvas with an empty circle, perhaps not museum ready quite yet. Uh, so let's, uh, let's make this uh, more interesting. And something that digital media can do that's often much harder to achieve in other kind of media is 
making something dynamic or interactive. So I'm going to have the user be part of, of the art that I'm making. And I'm going to say, how many circles would you like? And I'm going to expect them to tell me a number. So I'll use the in function to turn the text that they enter into a number. Now, what I would like to do is then take this count and make that many circles. So I can use the tools that we've talked about so far to, uh, to make that happen by writing a, a for loop that's going to repeat some number of times. And I can use the range function to say, give me a sequence that goes from 0 up to count. So now I have a loop that's going to iterate, that's going to repeat count number of times. And inside there, I can say, all right, my, I'm going to create another circle. And I'm going to make this one at a, a random position between 0 and the width of my window. And its second coordinate between 0 and the height of the window. And then I'll just make it uh, 10 by 10 as a size. And I'm also going to tell the graphics library to make this circle filled with some color. And I'm going to set that fill color to a random color. Random color is a function that I wrote in this random graphics file, which is also posted on the course calendar. So you can take a look at that function if you're curious. But it's going to give, give us a random color in the format that, that PGL expects. And the last thing is to add this circle to my window. All right, so it's asking me how many circles would I, would I like? How many circles would we like? I heard, I heard 20. And look, we have 20 circles scattered around our, our canvas. Uh, we can uh, do this again. Uh, what's a num another number of circles we would like? 500. 500. All right, we're getting some, some colorful circles. Uh, I'm, I'm a fan of uh, 2,000 circles. I think that looks nice. So now we have some, some variety, some color. Every time we run this program, we're going to get a different uh, set of, of random colored circles. And uh, the, the last thing that I want to, to show you as part of this, this art that I'm making is We've made it interactive. We've made it so that the, the, the user is, is part, of, part of the art there, saying how, much, how many circles uh, to be. But we can also make it uh, dynamic, make it change over time. Now, setting that up is uh, a little involved. So I'm not gonna, kind of going to kind of go through in detail uh, uh, how exactly this happens. But I just want to show you that uh, kind of what we can do with this uh, portable portable graphics library, where if I uh, say uh, this start random move function, which again is one that I wrote in this random graphics.py. And again, so I would like 2,000 circles, and now they are dancing around. Each one is moving around uh, every uh, uh, Every fraction of a second, I am choosing 10 random circles uh, and moving them uh, uh, in a random direction. So we've got kind of this interactive and dynamic uh, uh, display, um, and it did not take uh, did not take very much very much code to do. Uh, I can 
so that this uh, random random move is kind of a, a, a loop that chooses a circle and then kind of moves it a, a random distance. All right, questions. Uh, what are your What are your questions about how uh, how this uh, uh, these dancing circles came together. Any of the any of the code up here that it would be helpful for me to to go over. Yeah, again. Uh, this isn't necessarily in here, but in the the PGL file thing, it has errors that's making it not work when it's written in dark one. Um, like <laughs> this this import is is not working. Um. Yes. Uh, so one thing is if you copy paste it in uh, the code, make sure you've saved the pgl.py, make sure it's in the same folder. Um, and I, I can take a look at it uh, after class if, if it's not working. Import random graphics could not be resolved. Uh, you will need the, the random graphics.py, which is a, another file that's, that's on the course calendar. Other questions? All right, so something that we're going to start today uh, with, with lab two is uh, this will be our first pair programming lab. And on the calendar for today, in the reading, there's a link to pair programming guidelines. And so I want to spend a little time talking about what pair programming is and why we're doing it. So I want to start with why we're doing it. Uh, there are a few reasons. One, uh, research has shown that you will learn more by doing this style of programming in this class than if you work by yourself. So we're here to learn. This pair programming is going to help us with that. A second reason is that pair programming isn't just a thing that we made up for CS111. It's something that professional programmers use frequently in the real world because it turns out working together is a way to write better code and have more people understand what's going on. So put in a single sentence, pair programming is two brains, one computer. So what it's not is a way for you and your partner to split up the work in half and each do part of the lab. That's just going to result in each of you learning less because you're not going to, uh, to understand the half that your partner did. Um, the goal here is to have two brains, one computer, where one person is the driver, one person is uh, uh, using the keyboard and mouse, typing in code, and the other partner is the navigator. They are watching the screen, they are thinking about how the code the driver is writing fits into the bigger project, they are watching for typos or potential errors, and this driver and navigator, you and your partner should, are going to switch off every 20 minutes or so. Every 20 minutes, whoever was driving using keyboard and mouse hands those over, and they become the navigator. <coughs> An important point here, ignoring your partner's, your partner's input while you're the driver and just uh, typing away, that's uh, uh, not helpful to your learning and not helpful to their learning. And part of the spirit that I would like you to bring to pair programming is you are a steward of your partner's learning and to take responsibility for each other. So you are both responsible for understanding everything that's happening. And if your partner has a question, you are the steward of their learning. It is your job as their partner to help you both kind of uh, understand what's going on and, and reach the solution together. So, an important part of this two brains, one computer, is that you should minimize the amount of work that you're doing without your partner there. 
having your partner there is going to help there be fewer bugs because there's someone watching the code uh, as it happens. Uh, and also having you both there ensures that both partners are going to understand kind of what, it, what is going on and what has been done uh, on the lab. So one of the uh, more challenging parts often of pair programming is the scheduling part. You and your partner should both be there uh, working on it. So uh, you're going to be called upon to uh, be respectful of each other's time and to communicate to uh, find times that you can work as a team uh, in order to uh, in order to, to move through the lab together. It's also very important, um, not only that you are respecting your partner's time and, and, and effort, but also that you are uh, respecting your, your partner as a person. And that uh, you are working as a team and your role is not to uh, dismiss uh, or uh, or, or denigrate your partner's ideas, their contributions to the lab. Um, so the logistics for this class are that uh, uh, you have been assigned a partner and you will be with that partner on labs two and three. Uh, lab four will be individual. It will mostly be done in class and be due right before midterm break. And then uh, you will be assigned a, uh, a second partner for labs five, six, and seven. For labs five, six, and seven, you will have the, you, you will have the option to, to opt out and, and work on your own, though I encourage you uh, uh, for those to, to work with a partner. Uh, only one person needs to submit code to Moodle when you're working in a partner. Uh, it doesn't matter who. Um, if problems arise uh, and uh, you're having, having trouble uh, working with your partner or, or, or something has come up, please come, come talk to me uh, and uh, we, can, we can work it out together. Uh, questions about, uh, about pair programming? All right, so last step is to tell you who your partner is. Sorry. All right, so if you found your partner, exchange contact info, that's it for today. My office hour is starting shortly. Otherwise, see you on Friday. Okay.